chapter 65, Point of View. It was a quiet, stay-at-home birthday for me, with just the family. Pop was home, but he was still in trouble, just like Lucas said, for aiding and abetting Nora to flee the haven. Mr. Curry was in trouble too. As Luca had said, it looked like he'd lose his job for his role in helping Nora. All in all, it was a pretty rotten birthday. Except for when Sam had given me a present. Wrapped in newspaper, a book called My Sister's Sif by Ruth Park. I know you like that beady bow time travel one because of the book report you gave. And the bookstore person at Ferrell said the other one by her was really good, even though it's old now. It had a beautiful blue-green cover with this girl in a red bathing suit swimming with a dolphin. I wrote inside too, Sam said. I opened it up and there in Sam's neat handwriting it said, To Fred, love Sam on your 12th birthday, 1999. That had been good. It also hadn't been entirely rotten when Jed came over and ate sponge cake with whipped cream and fresh fruit that V had made for me. Or when I walked him back to his house afterwards, until the last 10 steps to the front door when he suddenly reached over and held my hand in his. That was really good. And I was thinking about all that when I rounded the curb back to mine and saw Mr. Curry at my front door, speaking with Luca. I ran up to greet him. I wanted to throw my arms around his middle and hug him. But that would have been weird, and impossible anyway, since he was holding something large and square and wrapped in brown paper in front of his chest. You want to come in, Furman? Annika shouted. From somewhere inside the house... But Mr. Curry looked between Luca and me and shook his head. You mind if we just chat for a bit here, Winifred? And he pointed down at the front steps. Take your time, Luca said, and he let the fly screen door close. But not before I saw him hustling Sam back inside. Uh, Your pop and I have had calls to spend a bit of time together lately, and he mentioned once or twice that it was today, Mr. Curry said, and he handed me the brown parcel. Happy birthday. I knew from the weight what it was, and from the shape too. I'd spent the whole term balancing Mr. Curry's personal copy of the ninth edition of Time's Atlas of the World on my lap, so of course I knew exactly how it felt, and it wasn't the least bit surprising when I opened it up to find exactly that. I can't take this, I said, and tried to hand it back to him. Nonsense, I insist, he said, holding his hands up, and besides, I'm not your teacher anymore, so it's perfectly appropriate. A proper present for a gifted former student. I snorted at that. <coughs> and then I ran my hands over the image of the earth on the front cover, the continent of Africa in partial view. You told us once that maps lie, I said, still tracing the continent that I remembered Mr. Curry said was three times the size it often drawn on maps. You know why they have to, though, don't you? Mr. Curry said, and I turned to him. Maps are designed to appeal to our human nature. The earth is imperfect. It's not even a perfect sphere. It's all lumpy land masses and constantly moving oceans and atmosphere. It's impossible to capture all that on a map, so we lie and simplify, and have been for hundreds of years. So, none of it's real? There's really nothing solid that we're standing on. The whole world is a lie? Mr. Curry leant forward and placed his elbows on his knees. He looked out past our front yard to the end of our street, over the rooftops and past the trees, and somewhere down there was the ocean stretching out people lie, which is why geography is such an interesting study of them, of us. He brought his hands together, threaded his fingers together, and no, I don't think the world is a lie, Winifred. It's just our perspective of it that could use some work. Do you know what that means? Perspective? I shrugged. It's everything we did in geography. It's the art of representing three-dimensional objects on a two-dimensional surface, so as to give the right impression of their height, width, depth and position in relation to each other. So, mapping, he nodded. It's that, but it also means your unique point of view, the way you see things. Most people, their point of view is very narrow. It's either what's right in front of them, or else only what they want to see, regardless of the facts. And what I think is very important, and truly rare, is to try to gain different points of view, a little more perspective of the world, which usually entails stepping out from your little corner of it and seeing through someone else's eyes. With that, Mr. Curry unlaced his hands and reached over to tap the atlas. Page 253, he said, and I opened to that. Tucked in the middle of the Oceana maps was a photo, except it wasn't printed in blurry black ink like some I'd cut out of a newspaper. 
This was an original photo, one that a journalist friend of Mr. Cruz had taken, when they'd come round to Pop's flat before the police arrived. It was full of colour. Nora and her baby Rose, sitting up in Pop's bed, and with Nora staring right into the camera, with her pleading eyes, black hair all a mess. Nora gave you that, a little more perspective, and you shouldn't underestimate how valuable it is, Mr. Curry said, slowly rising up, raising his hand against the sun, and kept talking to me. It's like everything has been redrawn, and you see the world as it actually is. Hold on to that, Winifred. Hold on to them, and I will too. Thank you.